Greetings fellow gamers, this is Five of Clubs, and today we continue our exploratory delve into Primal the Awakening. In the last episode, we took on the prologue Viraxan Dragon in all its flame-belching wrath, and I think we did alright. This time around, it's time to crank things up a few notches. We'll be playing a higher difficulty encounter with a few more mechanical bells and whistles toggled on, making it more representative of what we can expect a standard battle experience to be like in the final game. This battle, like the one before, is considered a standalone expedition encounter, with a preset configuration for our hero's gear loadouts and deck contents. We'll be granted some new helms, armors, weapons, and accessories compared to our basic gear from the previous battle, all of which we'll need if we want to stand a chance against this tougher beastie. Jason. I don't think the pig lizard was Gorgnak. What the f are you talking about? Say hello to the Toramat, a hulking rockosaurus that resides in the arid stillness of Thyria's desert domain. From the art shown on the boss mat here, it appears that this monster bears a craggy crust coating head and tail, both of which will likely be used to batter our heroes about the board. Like the Varaxan, this hardhead has a deck of 9 behavior cards, some of which host a few new trigger types, though it also has 2 special behavior cards that appear to get added into the behavior deck later in the scenario. We may be in for some surprises indeed. This desert battlefield also bears some new terrain tokens that will shake up the battle formula. On the one hand, it doesn't seem like we'll be dealing with card cancelling fire tokens, so that's a plus. On the other, we also won't have foliage or fauna benefits of the brush or the syrica plants. Thankfully, the Bethanus plant appears to grow comfortably despite the desert dusts. Speaking of desert dust, the left and right sectors will both have a sand token, which requires plus one stamina if you want to move out of those sectors. The board also has a few scattered rocks, which can apparently be discarded to prevent attrition damage, but I fear there may be alternative uses for these as well. Lastly, in the northern sector, there's a plateau stone that offers us a very unique effect. Quote, if you end your turn in a sector with a plateau, you may climb it by putting your miniature on top of the terrain token. When a monster reaction is triggered while you are on top of the plateau, you can jump onto the monster's back. Remove your miniature from the board and put it onto the behavior card that is being triggered, and prevent that reaction. That's already pretty awesome, mounting the beast bareback like we're breaking a bucking bronco. But there's a second portion to this effect as well. Quote, Then, reveal the top card from the attrition deck and discard the top card from your deck. Compare the attrition value with the stamina points of the latter. If the stamina points on the discarded card are equal to or higher than the attrition value, deal your weapon damage to the monster. Yeehaw! But if the attrition value is higher than the stamina points on the discarded card, you get bucked off the beast into a chosen sector and suffer attrition damage, which could be a bit risky in the late game. Naturally, you can't simply set up camp on the back of the beast. You'll dismount at the start of your next turn if you weren't thrown off before. We'll certainly have to take this terrain benefit into consideration when we see some scary looking behavior cards on the horizon. We've also got a new set of gear card goodies to explore as well, but just like a kid opening presents on Christmas, I think it'd be more exciting to open them up and share my first reactions with others. So let's head on over to the table and see if we can add Tora Matador to our titles. And everybody, we're just about ready to get started on our epic second battle against, uh, well, First battle against this guy, second battle in the game. Uh, the Toramat here, yes indeed. Uh, this big stony bony boy. And uh, we can actually probably see him a little better right over here on his boss mat. Very good. Yes, uh, I was looking at the art here. I actually can't see where its eyes are unless all these little things up here are eyes. It has a bunch of them. But uh, the beak shape of the head makes me think that um, this monster, like, uh, he's like a chicken. He, he pecks stone or, or smashes things. Uh, with this part of his face and the stance card as well the fact that we cannot play attack cards in the front sort of gave me that impression as well so I imagine being in front of the beast uh, probably not a great spot to be in but being at the back of the beast is not so great either it looks like because he has a nice uh, stegosaurus uh, club tail here so probably don't want to do that looks like the flanks are pretty uh, soft here no uh, little thorns or spines or any other protrusions to worry about so maybe we want to cut him up from the side maybe get a, a lucky shot at his gut 
something like that. That's, um, I mean, I guess I, I may be reading too much into the picture here, but that sort of seems like, uh, what I'm gathering here. So there we go. Let's go ahead and shuffle this right here. We got one, two, and three. We got three of these cards right here. Yes, we do. Uh, these two have symbols where when the monster rotates, it's going to resolve these effects, which isn't good. And then this one, of course, as we all know, is the one where when you, uh, when you start in front of the monster, he, uh, he resolves that. So there we go. Now, the Tormot uh, Stance card here has a win revealed effect. Despite being uh, Stance number one, Tormot gains one armor token. So I will go ahead and slot that right there. Now, armor tokens are special tokens for the boss that indicate here when you play an attack card, that's a red one, if the monster has an armor token, discard it and cancel the damage the card would have dealt. Both the weapon damage and the eventual additional damage from the card ability. So, like. If you played a red card that, you know, deals your weapon damage and then deals 600 additional damage, this one token would soak all of it. Um, that's pretty wild. So we probably want to use, like, a little attack to get the armor out of the way and save the higher damaging stuff, you know, obviously for when there's uh, no armor there. All right. But the armor is replenishing here. You see, during this upkeep step right here, which happens on the uh, monster's turn, sadly after... You give it struggle tokens for the turn. Uh, when it has four plus struggle tokens, it gains an armor token. And it can have more than one up here at a time. So we will probably want to have it not do that. And I think that actually complements its uh, flavor text pretty well. Over the years during their secular life, a Toramot Carapace can harden to become almost invulnerable to any element in Thyria. Well, <laughs> uh, hopefully we have uh, found ourselves a young one today who hasn't had a chance to harden up uh, against our elemental attacks, uh, or we're going to be in for some trouble, so that's not good. Now, this objective card actually doesn't enter play until he's in phase two, so I'm going to turn it sideways as a reminder to myself that this is not active right now. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our two characters today. Now, uh, one of them is a returning combatant from the first episode, and I was going to put Thoreg over here and just kind of keep it the same so that you could see kind of the before and after change. But I also wanted to show off one of the other characters, or at least try one of the other characters. So I have Darion, the Great Swordsman, right over here. I had considered uh, actually playing with Le Leonar, Lonar, uh, Sword and Shield guy. He looks pretty cool. I love the armor set. That was very awesome looking. But unfortunately, as you can see, the deck won't load in right for me. It looks really weird. Uh, I tried, like, clearing the cache and turning off mod caching and uh, trying to reload the assets, that sort of thing. I have no idea what's going on, but uh, in any case, uh, we'll have to look at him maybe another day because uh, his board is... And it's actually the only one that's like that. And as well, over here, his cards, yep, again, same sort of deal. And his mastery card is, is stretched weirdly, so... Um, not sure what, uh, what went on there. Something uh, bizarre to be sure, but in any case, uh, that it's kind of good because we get to see someone who's familiar so we could kind of compare how she worked before and how she works now and we get a brand new person to divvy it up. And then again, from a thematic perspective, uh, Thoreg fell at the end of the last battle, so maybe he's back at base, uh, resting up, I guess, or something like that. All right. Well, uh, Miss Mira, it's time to talk about her new kit and I'm, uh, Really excited here because uh, some of the things that I saw when I was divvying these cards out uh, looked pretty great. She has a bow that is called Abyss. You might notice uh, the uh, edges are a bit more colorful than the gray edges of the previous gear. Well, that's because this bow has an elemental affinity. You might be able to pick up on it. Uh, there's a coral symbol here if that didn't give it away. And then, of course, kind of a sea motif here. We have like a... I think this may be a sea serpent or a, a sea horse. A really angry looking seahorse just the way that it's uh, coiled there i guess it could go either way uh shells and and whatnot over here on this bow uh now this bow does coral type damage and now elements are going to be a big deal going forward because um the monsters will have elements and they'll have elemental strengths where they're strong against attacks from certain element types and weaknesses and we will have uh the same so this one actually is pretty lucky because this coral bow does extra damage to the monster because in this scenario, the monster is actually weak to the uh, coral type uh, damage. So we're going to go ahead and uh, put a token down here to remember that right there. So instead of dealing a four damage, it's going to deal five damage, which is pretty awesome. All right. A different deck constraints here. Not as many red cards, not as many yellow, but plenty of blue and green. And it has a new blue ability here. 
Play two blues uh, in succession. You could draw one card. The next cards you play this turn gain stealth. And notice it says cards, uh, plural. So if I started my turn, play two blues, all three cards after that, all are stealth. Uh, which is really... Sneaky, sneaky, sir. Seems very powerful. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll... Uh, I, I guess that's why there's so many blues here. Maybe we're supposed to make the best use out of that. Uh, perhaps. Okay, so that's the bow. We have a crystal helm over here, and it is from the crystal family of uh, gear as well. You can kind of see from the art, that crystal and structure. And with an ability of its own. When you suffer damage, search your discard pile for a card of your choice and place it on top of your deck. Um, <laughs> long range, anybody? <laughs> yes, this seems like a good way to loop long range. So that if I get damaged this time, I'm certainly not getting damaged next time. Uh, that sort of thing. Or actually, since there are fewer attack cards, you might want to put them on top there so that you could uh, get more uses out of them per shuffle, right? And you can see we have strong and weak uh, indicators here. We are strong one against coral and lightning damage in this helm. And we are weak one against uh, the, I guess that's, I think that's metal and frost. So if the monster does either of those damage types, we will have to take uh, an additional damage. And if it did either of these other damage types, uh, then we would take one fewer damage, which is pretty good. Now, this monster, it already actually shows you right up here, it has this claw symbol. It's called claw damage or bone damage. Um, some of the cards in here will indicate when he's doing claw damage, and if that's the case, uh, if we had any interactions here, we would modify the damage accordingly, but not uh, the case with this helm. We also have a reef-bound plate, which is a coral armor set. You can kind of tell with the fish skull shoulder pauldron there and so on. While you are not threatened, you have a hand size of plus one. Really? Wow. Okay. Uh, so it turns out she can have up to six cards in hand at a time. That might help feed us cards to be able to do this uh, ability here, to get those blues together. All right. It is strong against uh, fire and frost, weak against lightning, and I believe that's acid or poison. Uh, maybe it's poison damage right there. So uh, weak against those uh, types of things. Okay. We also have a new gear type right here called an accessory. There is one slot on each character board. The other three belong for potions, which gives you kind of a passive ability of some sort or some special uh, ad additional ability. This is the crystal spear. It belongs to the crystal family of gear, as you can see. It has a start of turn effect. At the start of your turn, if you have three or more blue cards in hand, deal, deal seven crystal damage just for having blue cards in your hand? Hold on. If you have three plus blue cards in hand, deal seven crystal damage. Wow. If you complete the active stance this way, inflict vulnerable. Double wow. Okay. Uh, well, having a hand size of plus one certainly means if you want, you could just hang on to like three blue cards and play with the other ones and you're dealing a, a consistent seven damage. That's, that's crazy. Well, okay, but... I guess if your plan was to do that, you'd only have three cards really to work with per round. And one of them or two of them have to be spent moving. So maybe that's not as viable a strategy as I may have thought. But interesting. Huh. And I did look at the rulebook about... Uh, I knew there would be accessories, so I did look at the rules for those. I don't see uh, anywhere in the rulebook where it indicates like a cost. Like maybe you can only use this once per, uh, you know... Uh, once per uh, game or like you have to pay a stamina to use the effect or anything like that So I guess you just have to meet the condition. That's crazy. Okay. Well, uh interesting to know We have the Aelmore the Alomar potion here with that consume effect. We saw this last time around uh, It's stronger if you drink it with a one or fewer Attrition card on top there So we'll have to keep that in mind and she actually has a brand new mastery card Remember last time she wanted to empty her deck and when she emptied her deck uh, excuse me, she flips over into the other side. Uh, this time around, now she has a blast card. It says, after you refilled your hand at the end of your turn, you may place a card under blast. If you do, place a counter on this card. And it, once she gets four counters, she gets to flip this and look at uh, whatever the backside does. Um, I don't know that I'm allowed to look at it ahead of time. So, like, I don't know if the rules let you do that. Because if I knew what was on the back side of the card, that would certainly um, influence which cards I may put under this card. Because I don't know what's going to happen to those cards. I, I doubt they're all going to go into play for free. That would be kind of crazy. Maybe like, maybe it has something to do with the stamina on them. And maybe it helps you somehow. Or maybe you actually get those cards in your hand or something like that. Because if... If the cards didn't do anything, it'd be kind of weird for you to have to put a card under here and place a counter on it. 
Otherwise, you could just discard the card to place a counter. Uh, if we weren't going to use the cards for something. So, that makes me think we're going to use it for something, but uh, for what? I don't know. And I guess that uh, will be a surprise for us all to enjoy. Okay, let's go ahead and draw up our starting hand. Four, five, and six, because uh, we are not threatened right now. And what mulligan action do we want to do? We probably will mulligan this one right there. This one here, and this one here. Maybe we'll keep uh, these three right here. How about that? Uh, too bad we didn't start with any blues. Uh, I guess we could mulligan in the whole hand and try and get some blues for the crystal spear. You know what? Sure. Let's do that, actually. Let's do that. All right. Here we go. We're doing uh, six new cards. One, two, three, four, blue, five. Yes. There we go. Six. There we go. And then we will go ahead and shuffle that. So we are actually going to be starting off with our uh, what we need for that spear to go off. So very good stuff. All right, let's go ahead and meet our new uh, warrior here, Mr. Darion. I love that sword. Uh, I love that the um, the hilt is this like dragon and it's like breathing out this like got a bone blade. We're actually not fighting with that blade today. We're fighting with a shimmer blade, which is a crystal sword here. Uh, looks like six attack, six maneuver, and then maybe not so many defense cards, four of each type. So maybe his idea is just to um, beat or bloody the, the enemy into oblivion uh, without needing to defend as much. At the start of his turn, if he has three or more red cards in his hand, reduce the stamina cost of those cards by one till the end of the turn. Oh, wow. Okay. So he doesn't have to hang on to the reds for the whole, you know, if he wants to keep using that ability. He doesn't have to hang on to them in perpetuity like this. In fact, the benefit expires at the end of his turn, so... I mean, it's not like if you hold them longer and longer, they're going to get cheaper and cheaper. So that's interesting. And actually, I noticed he had a reefbound plate as well. So he has a hand size of six. So that might be able to help him get uh, this condition fulfilled more often than not. And uh, four weapon damage right there. Looks like the monster is not weak or strong against uh, crystal damage. So it's just going to kind of be uh, the damage that's printed there. He also has a red dragoon helm, which appears to have been fashioned from the remnants of the Viraxan. Uh, it's a fire gear type here. And at the start of his turn, you may recycle one card, which means to discard a card from hand and uh, draw another one from the top of the deck. Um, might be interesting to do sometimes. Uh, I guess we'll have to see. It is strong against crystal and frost damage, weak against uh, this coral, and uh, actually the claw symbol there. So I actually put this token right here as a reminder because every once in a while, this monster is going to deal uh, that damage. So... Yes, I was told ahead of time in one of the comments that uh, he had uh, an armor piece that made him slightly susceptible to claw damage. So hopefully he won't be seeing a lot of it, but I guess we'll find out. Reefbound plate, we already talked about, plus one hand size when you're not threatened. Strong and weak against the same things as the other one. We have a fire, we or a fire shield here called the Lava Buckler, as you can see. It has a reaction here. When you suffer damage, you may discard a card for the top of your deck. If the card is yellow, cancel the damage. Okay, so it's like, um, actually to invoke, uh, invoke, actually the sword, I was going to say, the sword looks like a, a sword out of Dark Souls, one of the crystal swords. Now to invoke Dark Souls again, um, this shield right here is, uh, it's almost like you're parrying the attack. So I'm sure if I ever successfully pull that off, the, uh, parry sound effect is going to play in my head, obviously. All right, we have the Alamor potion. Oh, you know what though? The thing is, he only has four cards of yellow. Out of 20. Uh, so it's like a 1 in 5 chance. Oh, but I guess depending on what you have in hand and discard pile, you can kind of calculate odds on that. So maybe it's not as uh, a 1 in 5 chance after the game gets going. All right, uh, Alamore Potion again. And actually, this mastery is called Multiple Attacks. When you play two red cards next to one another, place a counter on this card. When you have two, you flip over to the other side to do whatever it does over there. So uh, another one that uh, is a bit of a... A wild card. We're not sure what's going to happen, but we are sure we're going to get six starting cards here. Okay, we have two reds. If we get a third red, we can make them a little bit cheaper here. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. What if we discard this and this and this one? Maybe we'll keep Heavy Clash. There we go. And surely in the next three cards, what if we get a third red, huh? One, two, there we go. There's a third red. Three. So we now have the three reds we need at the start of our turn to be able to uh, have some fun here. So. so it begins. And with that, we are just about ready to get started with the very first round of combat. Round one has begun. That's going to be two struggle tokens right there. One, two. 
and you'd normally discard the behavior card with the lowest number, or actually both in the case of a tie like this, but it does tell us in the manual to skip that on the very first uh, round of combat, which it is. So uh, I guess we are skipping that, and actually that's okay because Darion is just itching to tear into some Toramot flesh here. Um, but uh, it looks like the Toramot can sense fresh meat, actually, because he is not, uh, he's targeted poor Darion and he's about to hurt him because Darion is starting his turn right in front of the monster. So let's see what's going on. That is uh, Rasp, okay. Toramot gains two struggle tokens. If make it crash objective card is in play, Toramot activates blind rage. Uh, well, it's not in play yet because we're not in phase two, but it will be. And by paying a token, players in the front sector suffer two damage unless they immediately move by paying a green card. Okay, so it gets two, but then spends one. So it's going to have three remaining here, which is uh, bringing it uncomfortably close to being able to trigger that tough skin trait at the start of its next turn. So we might have to consider playing a blue card or two I, to keep it under. I'm not sure. All right, but let's pay a green. We definitely want to get out of there. So we're going to move any... Uh, well, <laughs> I was going to say we were going to... Um, uh, well, it, it looks like he doesn't have any greens. We were going to move anyway, but he doesn't actually have greens. Why did I think he had greens? Oh, she's got the greens. Okay, so she has the greens. All right. Well, I guess that means uh, two damage is coming to Darion. He's, uh, speaking of green, he is green, and, uh, he's new to this whole, uh, monster battling business, so, uh, he wasn't quite prepared for this rasp here. That's, uh, that's too bad. He took the bull by the horns, so to speak. Uh, uh yeah, nothing we could have done about that, as far as I can tell. Um, oh, well, actually, you know what? There is something we could have done. Lava Buckler. Reaction. When you suffer damage, you may discard a card from the top of your deck. If that card is a yellow card, cancel that damage. So we have four uh, yellow cards in this deck. And how many... Oh, we already have one in hand. So we only have three remaining in here. Hmm. Uh, that's three out of 14 chance. That's like uh, closer to one in five chance. 20%. Well, between 20 and 25%. Somewhere in the middle there. Oh, boy. Um, well, that is not... That's not great odds. Never tell me the odds. But, well, I guess... Even if we miss, it gets us closer to the other yellows in the deck. So maybe it'll, like, get future successes when maybe the boss is dealing higher amounts of damage. So I guess uh, it's not the worst thing. Let's go ahead and just give it a shot. You know, YOLO, right? <laughs> oh, hey, there we go. That's a, <laughs> that's a yellow, it turns out. YOLO, yellow. Very good. Uh, guard of the dragon, indeed. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, actually. Um... This Lava Buckler, it very well likely could have been created from the remnants of the Viraxan, which was a dragon. So you could, in fact, say that the Lava Buckler is a guard of the dragon. <laughs> wow, uh, that's pretty funny. I don't, I'm not sure the developers intended for that uh, interaction there, but I, I think it's uh, pretty funny. I at least appreciate it myself. Uh, what did we give up on, though? Because we're not going to see this till the next shuffle, at least. Cost one, gives one stamina. It has assist. Reduce the cost of the next red you play this turn by one. Interesting. Okay. Well, uh, it did, however, defend the attack for us, so let's get our health back. Uh, obviously, of course, those of you who know that I'm a Dark Souls fan, uh, obviously the Dark Souls parry sound played in my head when I saw that yellow come out, uh, because I'm not a filthy casual. A Darion is, uh, in fact, a pro gamer, so that was a pro gamer move. All right. Well, actually, I should apologize. Darion... I'm sorry, uh, I thought that uh, you just were not ready for that. It turns out you actually were ready. Uh, and you, you were playing 4D chess there, and I didn't <laughs> realize it. Okay, well, it's time for the start of our turn, and we have some start of turn effects, including uh, this one right here, where we may recycle one card. We probably don't want to recycle one of these red cards, because the other start of turn effect uh, rewards us for having red cards. So maybe we want to get rid of... I mean, this yellow, we can't play it to parry anyway. Heavy Clash removes the Struggle Token. That's kind of good. Uh, what else we got? This is pretty expensive. Maybe this one. Pressing Strike slash Draw 2. Okay. Uh, quick Thrust. When you discard Quick Thrust from Hand, inflict that. Oh, here we go. So this one, actually, when you discard Quick Thrust from Hand, you inflict Weapon Damage to the Monster. So uh, part of the Recycle Keyword, if I am uh, not mistaken... Yep, discard X cards from hand to draw X cards. So because we are discarding a card, we will actually get to resolve that. So let's do that. Let's have it discard quick thrust. All right, so that's going to be four damage right there because our shimmer sword or shimmer blade. What's it called again? 
Shimmer Blade, yep, uh, deals four damage. Now, those of you who are wondering why it doesn't go to armor, well, that's because the keyword for armor specifically states when you play an attack card. And we didn't play an attack card. If anything, we discarded a card. So uh, we get to pierce that. And actually, as well, that means that the Crystal Spear will deal essentially piercing damage uh, if armor tokens are up there as well. So something to keep in mind. Okay. And what do we get? We got a green card, Empty Fade. Cost one, you may immediately play a card with the slash trait from your hand without paying its stamina cost. Okay. Oh, interesting. So both of these have slash. So Berserk, look at that. That's a three cost right there. Well, I guess technically this turn it's two cost, one cost, and zero. But uh, three cost there. We don't have to pay that. But actually, it looks like it's best if you play it after um, an attack card, it looks like. Because uh, then you get to inflict vulnerable. So maybe we wouldn't want to use it on that. We could potentially use it on this, but it's only going to be one stamina to pay, play this card right now. So that seems like kind of a waste. Uh, deals damage, then deal one damage for the number of blue cards in your discard pile. So we probably want maybe even to put this card. Oh, you know what? This card actually has the slash keyword. Okay, I thought it was only attacks. Interesting. So attack, red cards have it, and actually this one has slash, and will let us draw two. So that that is actually kind of an interesting combo right there, letting us draw two. I definitely wouldn't, I don't get the uh, stamina cost reduction on this blue card, so it might actually be worth it to use Empty Fade to play Pressing Strike. But before we do any of that, in order to be able to attack, we actually have to, like, you know, move. <laughs> we do, we have to move. So, what if we go to Bethanus Land over here? We have to pay a stamina to do it, but what if we go to Bethanus Land... Uh, we need to pay one stamina. Ooh, I don't want to pay that. I want this to play this. Um, this card is going to be free, so I won't have to worry about paying for it. Maybe this card. I don't have a lot of blue cards in the discard pile anyway right now. So maybe I'll plan to play these two reds this turn. How about that? So we'll plop that right there. And we'll scoot on over to Bay Thanos Land just in case we take some attrition damage, right? Okay. Now, uh, now that we're over here... Let's discard another card to play Empty Fate. I hate the fact that we're paying uh, two stamina to potentially do it. Does she have an assist? Maybe that can help. Uh, she does not have an assist. So I don't like pay overpaying for it, but I think in the long run, it'll help us do kind of a pretty interesting turn. So let's do that. We're going to discard Heavy Clash to play Empty Fade right here. Gives us one defense against attrition damage. That's always good. And that will let us play uh, Pressing Strike, which being a blue card means we will remove one of these. And hopefully we can remove enough of them not to worry about tough skin, huh? All right. And that's going to let us draw two cards as well. One and two. What do we got? Coordinated Assault, which is blue. Choose an ally to discard a blue in order to deal two times their weapon level damage or replace the behavior card in play. Oh, that's interesting. So it actually lets you get rid of one of these cards up here. Okay interesting and then uh oh this is a common kind of card we've seen a green that costs two generates two and lets you draw two um okay gotcha so let's see this card's gonna play itself for free so we could play this next we could actually play coordinated assault but the thing is we don't want her discarding a red or a blue card because then she won't be able to use the spear so uh let's not do that instead let's just play this card for free right here which is going to deal 4 damage, and that will go to the armor tokens. We got that out of the way. There we go. And we have to pay 2 stamina to play this. So we're going to discard this one right here to play this 2 stamina berserk. Again, it's 2 stamina because of our shimmer blade, which is going to deal 4 damage right here to the beast. 1, 2, 3, 4. And because it was played after another attack card, it's going to inflict the vulnerable status right here. So... Next damage that gets dealt to the Toramat is going to be doubled, and we actually happen to know the Crystal Spear is about to deal 7 damage to it, so that's going to be 14 damage. Unless, um, I don't know, maybe some shenanigans gives it another armor token. That would be, uh, I'd probably cry. <laughs> okay, well I think that's about all we want to do, because we don't want to use this card. So, uh, let's give that a quick shuffle, and let's reveal our attrition card. Ah, it's 2. Alright, so given that it's 2, that means it does surpass the defense here, meaning we take 2 damage there. Do we dare try another parry? There's 10 cards left, two of which are yellow, I think, right? Because we have two in the discard, yep. Uh, what's the harm? Let's give it a try. Uh, nope, Tactical Maneuver, which is blue. So, what does that do again? 
or well, I haven't seen it, but uh, it says choose an alien sector or an adjacent one to draw one. Okay, so it's okay. That's a, kind of a support card. It's okay that it, it didn't work out in our favor this time, but uh, that two damage actually did come to us. So one, two, three, and four. Discarding in the order that uh, we played, of course. And we get to draw up to six because we are not threatened. Five and six. Ah, oh, we only have two reds. If we had a third red, then uh, we'd be in business for the sword here. But we don't appear to have that. Maybe maybe she could assist us on the next time and in, in something. Or maybe next time the recycle effect can uh, get us a red, maybe. I don't know. We'll have to see. All right. And then last but not least, of course, the Tormat turns to face Mr. Darion. But that will trigger both of these cards right here. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger. Swing, swing, swing. Uh, this one. Alright, Tail Swipe. Deal two damage to all players in the rear sector. If there are no players in the rear sector, all players in the flank sector suffer one damage. Targeted players may discard a green card from their hand or destroy rock terrain in their sector to avoid the damage. And it does have two tokens, so it'll pay those. Targeted players can only avoid damage by destroying a rock terrain in their sector. So here we go. Those are getting paid. So, now we actually got lucky because there is a rock over there. Um, but we have to decide if we want to just take the damage or not. Uh, if we, well, if we took the damage, we wouldn't get this benefit of putting a card from our discard pile on top of our deck. So, I think, let's just let the rock go. Goodbye, rock. There you go. That tail swiped and it swiped right into a rock. So that rock, uh, did its job. Maybe that's why those rocks are there. Alright, and this card triggers as well. This is Heavy Swipe. Deal two damage to all players in the rear sector. If there are no players in the rear sector, all players in flank sectors suffer one damage. Uh, it's kind of the same as the other one. Targeted players may discard a green card from hand or destroy rock terrain in their sector, excuse me, to avoid that damage. Oh, and if it had two uh, struggle tokens, it would actually get two extra damage. So that'd be four damage. Yeah, I would definitely discard a green in that case. Do I even have a green? I do. I like this green. Um, hmm. I could discard this. Yeah, again, we don't have any cards in the discard pile, so I'd hate to take damage and not get the benefit of that. So, uh, evasion, uh, goodbye. You're going to the discard pile because we don't want to take damage from, uh, the big beast's tail. Oh, crap. And here, speaking of tail, look at that. We got a tail right there. And now that it's the start of Mira's turn, this tail card is going to resolve. Oh, gosh. Man, this is, uh, an active monster this turn. Uh, disrupt. All players in the rear sector discard one red card from hand, okay? Uh, she's the only one in the rear sector. Oh, you know what? We lucked out, actually. Look at this. We don't have any red cards. Does it say anything else? No, it does not. Okay, so we got lucky. Okay, so the tail card is kind of good <laughs> sometimes. If, if you don't have reds, then uh, the tail card is great. Or if you have too many reds, I guess the tail card could also be great. Wow. Okay, well, now it's our turn. Uh, first and foremost, we have to decide if we want to move. Which, since we are in a sandy sector, is going to cost us two stamina to do. Uh, hmm. That means either this card or this one. This one could potentially... Oh, wait! It's the start of our turn! It's time to hit this beast! Yes! For 14 points of damage! There we go! Bringing it from 22 to 8. Wow, that's quite a hit. Alright, thank you, Crystal Spear. Really appreciate your, uh, your contribution to the battle effort there. And now it's time to skedaddle. So let's skedaddle to the rock. I'm going to go to the plateau. Here we go. Hanging out at the plateau. That seems like fun. And, um, so if we played acrobatics by discarding some cards, we could draw three more cards and potentially have a bit more fun on our turn. Do we have any assists over here? We sure don't. Or, ah, that does seem like a lot of fun. Let's discard this one and this one, perhaps. There we go. And actually, when you discard Quick Shot from hand, you volley once. Let's go ahead and reveal the next one. Ah, it's the uh, it's the Quick Assist card, so uh, that's too bad that's there. Oh, but if we take damage, you can put it on top of the deck, so at least that's, there's that. All right, but no, uh, no interest, at least uh, as far as volleying. We didn't get any free volley damage. Too bad there. That's going to play Acrobatics. Gives us a little bit of defense there. And then let's also play this card right here. It's going to uh, remove a blue token. The blues are actually already gone. So that's going to just... We can't recycle one because we don't have any cards. So we're going to draw three. One, two, three. Oh, we have Perfected Stretch here, which we want to be on top of the discard pile by the start of our next turn. 
Hmm. I could discard called shot to play perfected stretch. Maybe that's what we'll do. You know what? Actually, let me back up just a smidge. Because let's not forget what this weapon card does. This weapon card, when you play two blues in a row, draw one, and the next cards you play this turn gain stealth. The reason why that jumped out at me is because I remembered we have a red card right up there that's going to trigger. Maybe I don't want to deal with that. So maybe I play this card right there. Let's just remove another blue, which, well, we really can't. But interestingly, though, let's just draw a card right here. That's perfect. And then uh, the next cards we play gain stealth. So ah, oh, it's that other uh, quick assist card. So if I wanted to play Perfected Stretch, I would have to get rid of this. I do love that Quick Assist. Or I could get rid of Long Shot, I guess, since really this one's not as good until we're in Beast Mode. So, you know what, maybe that's it. Well, I'm going to hang on to the Assist, hoping it could pay off for us. So we're going to do that. It's slightly overpaying, but I think it's worth it. And let's not forget, we inherit the Aggro Token for this. So there we go, 5 damage to the Beast. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're not triggering that. Because uh, the cards that we play for the rest of this turn are stealth. I am very, very sneaky, sir. Thanks to our weapon. So thank you, Abyssbo. Really appreciate that. Okay. All right. I think that's about all we're going to do for our turn. So we're going to reveal a card. It's the three. Okay, so we've seen the two, uh, two and a three already, though. So that bodes kind of well for the rest of the game. So, all right, two damage here for attrition. And we get to put one of these cards on top. We could put long shot up there. But uh, I do love the quick assist, don't I? So we're going to put quick assist up there. How about that? Or maybe we don't do that one until we take more damage later. Maybe we put another blue in our, our hand so we could try and build up blues again for the spear. Maybe. Let's see if that's quick assist. Or at least it'll maybe do the double blue ability right here. So you know what? Crazy enough, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna put this quick shot up there rather than uh, the quick assist because we already have a quick assist in hand. I don't think we need two of them in hand. It might just clog it up a little bit. I want to break them up so that I have one quick assist in hand at a time. That's sort of the idea there. All right. Well, we have uh, done that. So we're gonna go ahead and discard our cards, of course, in the order that uh, they were played. So very good, and we are not threatened. So we get one, two, three four, five, and six. There we go. We have two of these, so if we wanted to trigger that weapon thing again. Now, we have to decide if we want to put a card under Blast at the end of our turn after filling up our hand. I think we will. Maybe this repositioning card right here. I don't think I'll miss that too much, just in case, uh, I don't know, something crazy happens, like those cards are banished from the game or something. All right, so we'll plop that right there. One counter earned. Very good, very good, very good. All right. Oh, speaking of which, I forgot. These two were played in succession as well over here. So he should have a counter on his card. There we go. Sorry. Let's not forget that. Okay. All right. We are making progress, gang. We're, uh, we're really making progress. Okay. And I think that's it. So now it's the end of the round. Oh, no. Sorry. It's uh, one last thing she wants to do at the end of her turn. Climb onto the plateau. And there's a big important reason for that. At the end of your turn in a sector of the plateau, you climb it by you may climb it by putting your miniature onto the terrain token. When a monster reaction is triggered while you are on top of a plateau, you can jump onto the monster's back. If you do, remove your miniature from the board. Put it into the behavior card that's being triggered and prevent that reaction. And then there's a second ability that'll uh, happen shortly, and we'll see what that is in a second. So yes, uh, this card is about to trigger because it's the end of the round, but. Because we're up here, we could actually have Miss Mira try to cancel that card. And I think that's a good idea. We've already seen a 2 and a 3 from here, and that is important because of this. Then reveal the top card of the Attrition deck and discard the top card from your deck. Compare the Attrition value with the Stamina drops on the ladder. If the Stamina points are equal or higher than the Attrition value, deal your weapon damage to the monster. Otherwise, you suffer attrition damage and are thrown to the ground, which puts you back out on the board. So we've already seen 1, 2, and 1, 3, so I'm betting there's a, a good bit of 1s in here. So let's reveal what we got. Why? 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 Oh, of course, it's the other another 2. Oh my gosh. Okay, so this next card has to have 2 stamina drops or more, or we're getting thrown to the ground. Let's see what happens. We actually lucked out. Look at that. There are two drops right there. Oh my gosh. I know, she doesn't have a whole lot of those. 
So uh, that worked out pretty well. That's going to deal five damage. Three, one, uh, and then minus two, which brings it in to phase two right here. 28. Very good. Wow. So we're in the in just the first round of combat, it seems like. We uh, took it down one entire phase. That's crazy. Okay. Excellent job, Miss Mira. I really appreciate it. You did a great job. Now it's actually the start of round two. Monster's going to get two struggle tokens. Oh, wait. Before that, let's, uh, of course, escalate the monster to its next phase. Right. <laughs> let's not forget. Okay. Uh, Tormat level two. Same attack vectors here. When revealed, Tormat gains two struggle tokens. Okay. Let's not forget that. One and two. Right there. And shuffle charge and smash behavior cards into the behavior deck. Okay, well, so that means these are going right over here. Now, uh, these cards appear to have a star icon. I'm not sure what that means, uh, really. Oh, wait, no, I think it has something to do with the objective. And a blue icon. So if we play a blue card, it'll trigger these cards. That's not so good. Okay, so those are shuffled in. We're going to start seeing those populate on the board here. It now has a second peril card called Furious. When Toramat gains... One additional struggle token when it escalates, which means uh, when this deck depletes over here and it reshuffles the discard pile, instead of getting the one it normally gets, it gets two now. Also, when a player moves, Torimot gains one struggle token. So every time we move, oh gosh. All right, and then we have the objective token. Hopefully this can give us some reprieve. The active player may discard a blue card during their turn to trigger any behavior card uh, with a star in play. Well, don't it already trigger on blue? Why wouldn't you just play the blue card? Because if you play the blue card, you get the benefit of removing the tokens or whatever else it does. Huh. Oh, maybe it's for, like, if you have a blue card in hand, but it costs, like, a stamina price you can't or don't want to pay. Okay, so you can actually purposely trigger these cards. Interesting. So maybe there's a reason why you'd want to do that. Blind Rage. Place one counter on this card. If it exceeds uh, four counters, all players suffer one damage. And I don't see it say, like, and then discard a certain number of tokens. Oh, maybe that's what these cards do. Maybe this is how you uh, get cards off of Blind Rage somehow. So maybe Okay, that would explain why you'd want to activate them, or, like, purposely trigger them. Hmm. But you might maybe need to do it in a certain way. Like, maybe you... I don't know. Maybe you want to trigger it when you're behind it, or something May oh maybe it's the rock maybe you want to trigger it in a spot where you're with a rock because it seems like the rocks kind of protect you maybe you can hide behind the rock i don't know in any case i guess we'll we'll find out if it happens right okay so yes it's now in uh, phase two now thankfully this is gone the thing about uh, gaining armor tokens because with this much uh, struggle token gain it would be armored like all the time. <laughs> all right. And now we're actually in round two. And since it has two of these, it's going to get two more for the start of its turn. Here we go. One, two. And we get rid of the lowest numbered card here, which actually is this red. So we'll pop that right there. And now we have uh, this one right here. It's going to punish us for playing blue. Okay. All right, Ms. Mira, it is the start of your turn, which means that uh, you get to uh, dismount from this creature, as it says here. Um... Uh, yes, at the start of your next turn, get down from the plateau, or if you're on the monster's back, you're thrown to the ground, and that is defined here. When you're thrown to the ground, choose a sector on the board and put your miniature into that sector. So, um, for example, maybe we, uh, maybe we go back, let him throw us back into plateau land. Maybe we get back on the, uh, up on the plateau to hop on his back. Perhaps. Yeah, maybe that's what we'll do. Yeah, because, um, yeah, I'm not going to move, which is going to make me threatened, but I have long range here. So even though uh, that's going to happen, it's not going to be uh, a huge deal, really. How many cards? We have 10 cards in there. How many of them have aim here? Let's just double check. One, two. Okay, so two cards. We could get rid of, like, all the struggle tokens if we uh, played multiple shot here after a blue. Which we might want to play two cards anyway to get the benefit of this. Oh, but if we play a blue card, this is going to happen. Hmm. Maybe we don't want to play a blue card. Maybe we want to hang on to blue cards to try and get a third blue card so we could do our spear next time. Maybe that's what we'll do. So in that case, I need to get this long range card in the trash. 
so or on top of the discard pile so as much as i like to usually discard fighting edge from hand to do something maybe instead i will actually discard long range to play fighting edge there we go make sure to get my threatened token for not moving there we go all right so we have one little defense right there but again we have long range so we're good to go on that i think what i'll do is i'll keep the rest of this definitely the quick assist to help out our friend over here um who still yeah he doesn't have assists so uh i think that's what i'll do and i'm just gonna end my turn right there i think that's exactly what i'll do and we're gonna get one two three of these oh uh, let's as well reveal the attrition zero and one okay yep so that makes sense there we go zero and one neither of them are going to work well we didn't really need long range actually you know what if i'd thought about that i may not have wasted long range because we've already seen two twos and a three so uh, i think there may only be one other two in that deck um so i may not have wanted to use long range just yet but actually it turns out we just got another copy of it right there so uh that's pretty good uh we filled up our hand we need to decide if we want to put one under blast here um let's put let's put backflip in there i usually don't tend to miss that one too much either so there we go backflip right there second token and uh, of course let's climb on the plateau again just in case and of course Toymont is going to rotate to face our friend miss mira there we go all right excellent well it's uh our friend uh, darion's turn he's gonna heal one for starting his uh turn in bethanis land and i suppose he is actually in a flank sector oh if you're in a flank sector you may immediately oh you know what though you know what though back flip she's threatened so she's only supposed to get five cards so let me just shuffle that um she's only supposed to get five cards to end her turn uh which she would have had backflip anyway but still what i really wanted to uh correct was just the fact that she should have four cards right now not five there we go all right so he has to decide if he would like to move at the start of his turn um i um maybe maybe he'll move to the rock that cost him one stamina to do that uh he could do it with this one right here squeak right there all right and it's the start of his turn so he may recycle one if he wants i think he will let's recycle this one right here oh and look at that we actually got another red Look at that. We have three reds here. So now when we resolve this start of turn effect, look at that. We have three plus reds in our hand. Reduce the stamina cards, uh, cost of those cards by one to the end of this turn. So we got one, one, and three. Fascinating. Okay. All right. That's pretty good. That is pretty good. Two blues. Um, right. Okay. So, right. Now that we're in the back spot here, I don't think we want to play any blues because we're going to potentially accidentally trigger this. We really don't know what it does yet, and I'm not really sure I want to find out yet. Um, so, interesting. If you're in a flank sector, you may immediately play a blue for free, or play a red for free. That could afford this. So maybe uh, it might be nice to hang on to both of these here. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'm going to have her do that quick assist for us here. There we go. And that's going to give him one more card. Just gives him a little bit more uh, buying power, and it sure does here. So I want to try and keep this one if I can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend this card to play double slash right here. There we go. That's going to deal uh, four weapon damage here. One, two, three, four. Lovely. Oh, and because he moved, that's one struggle token to the monster as well. Let's not forget. All right. And then I want to play lacerate as well, but I don't want to use this to play it. So I think I'm going to discard swift to play lacerate there we go which is going to deal four damage then deal three times weapon level additional damage for each card with the slash trait in your sequence i have two of them so that's going to deal six additional damage on top of four is 10 but also three more damage right here that's 13 damage so uh, from 24 down to uh 11 Woo! that was a great hit mr darion very good and look at this this is two reds, so you know what that means. That means that is the second uh, counter on multiple attacks, and it's time to see what this thing does. Let's find out. Bunkai.
Multiple attacks reduce the stamina cost of all red cards you play by one. <gasps> That's basically this, except that you don't even have to have three in hand to do it. If these things combo together, oh my gosh, that'll be crazy. So like theoretically right now, this only costs two uh, because it's minus one stamina for that and minus one stamina for the Oh my gosh. Darion, you are uh, an aggressive beast. My goodness. Okay. Uh, well, I... I think that's about all I can do as far as, like, defense. I think I want to keep both of these. So I'm going to get a stamina token. Here we go. Now we'll plop that right there. And it's time to reveal uh, one of these attrition cards, which I think we've seen the zero, so it's probably going to be a one. Yep, it's a one. Okay, so that's going to be two damage still, right? Yep, two damage. All right, do I want to try to parry the uh, attack here? Let's see. We have one, two, three yellows in there. And we have two cards left. Oh, man. Okay, so what? it's a 50-50 shot. I mean, we have to, right? Oh, thwart! Darn it! We have been thwarted in our effort to parry. Uh, we flubbed that parry uh, attempt, didn't we? Oh, gosh. All right, so, man, that means that that's the fourth yellow, if I'm not mistaken. Man, oh, too bad. So close. Well, you know what? Actually, I guess that's kind of fair, right? Uh, we started out with, like, a crazy lucky parry. So now when it was almost guaranteed... Uh, we didn't get it. So, I think that's probably fair in, in the long run of, of things. So, here we go. Two of those here. We did move. So, we're going to get uh, six cards here. Three, because we're not threatened. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. One more damage because it's a level one weapon. Four, five, six. Oh, wow. Look at that. We have... Oh, boy. We're in for a power turn this next time because now we have Shimmer Blade and we have the Mastery card, making these uh, quite affordable. All right, perfect. Now, um, one thing I forgot to check, double slash. Let me just double check here. I'll reshuffle it if I have to. Lacerate, yep, Lacerate inherited the aggro token. That's what I needed to, to check there. So I'll reshuffle that. All right, so since it inherited the aggro token, the monster is going to turn at the end of its turn to face poor Darion. All right. I got you now, SpongeBob. <laughs> Almost jumping the gun. Almost. There we go. Uh, this end of round thing is going to trigger right here. Well, guess what? Uh, Mira is, I think, just going to jump on top of it because uh, she's been having pretty good success with that. So there we go. We're going to discard one card here. That's a one. And we are going to discard one card here, which gives us one right there. So that's going to be five damage. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. Now it's going to be there. Now it gets the tokens. Now it discards this card. How about that? All right. Well, now the turn is starting with Darion here. So since he's starting his turn in front of the monster, this card and this card are both going to trigger. But thankfully, Mira is on the back. So I think not. We already know we've seen two twos and a three. I think two two. <laughs> we've seen two twos and a three. I think she should cancel that right there for sure. And uh, let's see if we can try and get some, um, try and get some uh, more damage on this beast. That there's a one, perfect. Okay, so she is gonna damage herself right now. And since she, uh, she reshuffles the deck, I don't think she gets the benefit here for doing that. So there we go. And let's uh, drop that. Ah, oh, it's a two. So we overcommitted here. It turns out by a little bit. But hey, hard to turn down more free damage, right? There we go. Five more damage right there. And actually, this card triggers as well. Because uh, these cars trigger, well, this one triggers, and this one triggers as a result of that one triggering. Yes, uh, trigger, trigger, trigger. So she is going to block this one as well, I think. Might as well give it a shot. That's another one, which we know uh, she's going to be able to make happen. Oh, man. She's burning through all her two stamina ones. That may play into our future uh, calculations here. But, again, another five damage. One, and then that's four damage to uh, this next phase, phase three. Bringing it to 41 health. My gosh, that was crazy. The plateau um, may be a little powerful. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's crazy. So, all right, here we go. I mean, I guess, you know, we just happen to get a pretty fortunate shuffle of the attrition deck. Because you could be thrown off by an unlucky 2 or an unlucky 3 uh, here or there. Or if you had a wound card like these... The, if you had this in your deck and you actually revealed that card, it doesn't have any stamina. So you could even fail a one uh, that way, supposedly. So uh, in any case. So 
Yes, uh, let's see what happens here. We are discarding this card, and this card actually remains in play uh, because it has that little asterisk icon. So both of these are going to be active. So he's getting additional uh, struggle tokens when the escalation occurs, and getting uh, whenever players move, they get struggle tokens. And while the Tormod has 8 plus struggle tokens, add plus 1 to all attrition cards you reveal. So thankfully he's just one shy of that, but he's a little close for comfort there. And Tormach gains one Acceleration Token. Here we go. Oh, gosh. Uh, this Acceleration Token adds to the number of uh, Struggle Tokens it gets when it gets the Struggle Tokens at the start of its turn. So uh, during the Struggle Step, it usually gets two. Now with this up here, it's going to get three every uh, time it does that. And it also has increased uh, damage here. So it's getting dangerously close to Unleashing, which would be quite devastating for us. And it has the Earthquake Keyword. Which I don't see on here. I don't see it here. Uh, maybe it's in the enemy keywords section. Let's find out. Accelerate bonus. Escalation, not earthquake. Upkeep. Uh, maybe it's in hunter keywords. Probably not. Nope. Oh, you know what? It's probably in the scenario booklet. Let me uh, take a quick peek here at the uh, the scenario. Special special rules. Yes, earthquake. This event may be triggered by card effects during the game. When that happens, immediately remove the plateau terrain, replace it with two rock terrains in that sector. All players there in that sector suffer one damage. Okay. Uh, well, actually, you know what? There is no one over there. Technically, uh, she's on the beast's back, riding a bareback. And actually, you know, it's funny when she's um, staying on top of it and shooting these arrows into it. It's reminding me of that scene from Lord of the Rings, uh, maybe Return of the King, I think. Where um, Legolas climbs up the Mimikill and gets right behind the neck of the, the elephant and shoot arrows into the neck. Reminds me of what Mira's doing. I guess she took notes uh, watching that film. Alright, so uh, the plateau is gone. And maybe that's kind of for the best. Because I think we were making amazing use out of it. Uh, maybe even in too good use. <laughs> so, uh, right. Uh, we now have two rocks here though. So those rocks will help us with uh, the attrition damage. Because let's not forget... The rock's base effect, uh, right here. When you receive a damage from attrition, you may remove the rock train from your sector in order to prevent the damage. And now that it just gave us some more rocks, it makes me, like, twice as confident in the idea that uh, these special uh, cards that we brought into play from this have to do with the rocks. Because it's like, if you spent both of these rocks, then you'd just be out of luck. But now that it just gave you these, it almost seems like... Maybe it's giving you more rocks to be able to do that going forward. I'm not, that's just a hunch, but it seems to my like brain, as far as design perspective, that makes sense. And it also is pretty clever that the plateau, when the monster breaks it, turns into two rocks. I think that's uh, clever from a thematic perspective as well. Yes. Okay, so funny enough, all this stuff just happened as a result of the start of Darion's turn. So, Darion, my friend, uh, I think it's time for you to actually take your turn, shall we? Uh, first thing we have to do is decide if we want to move. We definitely do because we still can't attack this beast from the front. So, maybe we will spend our stamina to skedaddle over to Bethanis land just in case we take some damage, huh? All right. Now, we could, for instance, now that we're in the flank sector, we could use Time Slash, which, for one thing, will get rid of one of those struggle tokens, and for another... Uh, we get to play a red card for free. This is quite a quite an expensive red card right here for four. Well, actually, I guess right now it only costs two, which is pretty good. Speaking of, uh, yes, so it only costs two for him right now. This is free, and this is basically free. Oh wow. Okay. Um. Hmm. Yes, maybe. Search your deck for red card. Add to hand. Don't think I want to do that. And uh, at the end of your turn, choose an ally to draw one for each uh, one of these symbols in your deck here. Yeah, let's start with Timed Slash. I think I will pay for that with Evasive Step right there. So we'll put Timed Slash into play right there. Let's get rid of one of those. Boop. There we go. Oh, and because we moved, though, let's make sure he gets his token because uh, he is uh, that is his due. And if we were in the flank sector, we could play a red card for free. The problem is I don't want to do that in this case because I want to play this after a red card for this to be um, as effective as it can be. 
So what I'll do, I guess I'll play this one. Double slash. Here we go. It's going to be uh, four damage to the monster. One, two, three, four. Here we go. Right out. Double slash. And then if we play a red card after, we'll do a little bit more damage, which is always a lot of fun. Um, right. And let's see what else we might want to do. If we play this one right now by paying the two stamina here, then uh, we'll be able to double the weapon's damage here. Four times two is eight. Oh, and you know what? We could actually stun the monster and inflict vulnerable because we're in beast mode. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, we're going to do that. <laughs> we're going to pay this card to play Dragon Strike right here. There we are. That is four damage. We get to double that weapon damage. But interestingly, we get to add this three to it first. So four plus three is seven. Uh, seven times two is 14 damage. And we get to throw a uh, vulnerable token after that. So 37 minus 14 is 23. Wham! There we go. But the fun is not yet done because we also get to stun the monster. So we get to pick one of these, put a stun token on it, and uh, enjoy some fun with that. So... Let's see, how about this one here? There we go. Because uh, she's not going to be able to do the plateau to block it anymore. So we'll put the stun token there, and uh, I think that will be just fine. Now, does she have any red cards in hand? She does, which means that we're going to do the right damage this time. Instead of dealing your weapon level damage, you're actually you're supposed to deal your uh, weapon damage itself. So that's five damage right there. Times two, because of this right here, is 10 damage. So that's bringing it down to 13 health. Boom. All right. Wowzers. And you know what? We even have one more card we could play right here for free. There we go. That's going to be another four damage right there. 12, 11, 10, and nine. Nine, nine, nine. My gosh. What a great turn. Woo. Darion! Amazing! Uh, now, of course, we're probably going to get some attrition damage, but uh, I think it was worth it because we just uh, nailed this beast for quite a bit. Alright, that's two, so yeah, that, of course. And he's going to get three damage right there. Let's just try and parry it. Who knows? We might get it. <laughs> yes! Deflect! So we began the game with an epic parry. We uh, appear to be closing out the game, or at least getting quite a, very close to it, by uh, deflecting and parrying that damage as well, which would have been three damage there. Wow. Oh my gosh. That is epic. Darion, you are a beast, sir. All right. I told y'all. He, uh, he was a pro gamer. <laughs> right. And he does not have uh, his threatened token, so he gets six cards. One, two, three, four, five, and six. There we go. Six cards. There we go. And then let's turn to face our friend Darion at the end of the turn. And Miss Mira at the start of her turn needs to dismount from this creature. Uh, now we get to pick which quadrant she is dismounted in. Um, how about... What if we dismount her here in the double rock terrain? That seems pretty safe right there. And additionally, she has to decide if she wants to move. She could move, I suppose. But I kind of like her there. We also have a long range right here. So as long as I put something into play... Let's see, does he have anything that assists? He does. So let's discard that to give her one more card just to see if that'll help. Okay, so... Uh, well, it's already past the start of her turn, so I don't know that I get the spear damage. But that would be fun, wouldn't it? All right, well, I think what I'll do is I will play... I could discard these three to actually do the weak spot, which inflicts vulnerable again, but the problem is I don't know that anyone's going to damage this creature um, before the end of the turn. I could play two of these to get this going on, which could be kind of fun, um, to draw one and then have the cards be in stealth, maybe. Maybe. Oh, this could help us get uh, get rid of some of those tokens. Oh, we just reshuffled a bit ago, so there's probably not a whole lot in there. When you discard quick shot from hand, gain volley one. So if I did like one, two, three, like that, uh, we get volley one from that. And I'm discarding three to play this card here, of course. So, 
Yeah, that's what I think I'll do. So we'll volley one, which actually, funny enough, uh, does do the damage here. So that's going to be one, two, three, four, five. There we go. And funny enough, actually, we paid our three to be able to play weak spot right here. Boom, which is going to deal another five damage. The monster only has four health, bringing it down and defeating this beast. There we go. All right. And that's how it's done, folks. I can't help but feel as though this fight leaned a little toward the easy side. But I've been told that the hero loadouts in this fight are rather generous for the sake of demonstrating fully kitted characters. Meaning that the heroes won't have nearly this much gear in a normal encounter with this beast. Even if it ended up making the fight a little easier, I definitely appreciated being able to gaze at the gear work involved in a full-fledged fight. I certainly felt that there were more mechanical cogs in the mix for this battle but thankfully not so many that it ended up feeling too fiddly or unwieldy. I imagine increased familiarity with the game will pay dividends in how much active recall effort is required to remember all the triggers and conditions in play. But I also imagine that playing in a physical tabletop setting where I can take in the whole board at a glance will help with that as well. Although, I've been informed that the demo we've played here is akin to a version 1 of the final game design. A primal primer, if you will. Indeed, thanks to the informative efforts of YouTube users Fenraylis and Elzheis, hope I didn't <laughs> botch the uh, pronunciation too hard there, I've learned that the current direction of the game design has taken on a few more interesting ideas that will address a couple feedback points that I planned to address here in the final thoughts section. For starters, the character-specific keywords in the hero decks like Rampage, Aim, Berserk, etc. are going to inherit new keyword effects rather than simply interacting with the occasional card or two. For example, the Berserk keyword in Darion's deck will now host a secondary benefit along with its original effect. Every time you deal damage, you may reveal a card with the Berserk keyword from your hand to draw one card. Other keywords have received similar tweaks and additional functions, like Confuse, which lets you rotate the monster now, rather than just discarding behavior cards. That could certainly prove pretty useful. The Kickstarter updates also indicate exploration of an overarching theme structure for the different element types, both from the gear end and the monster end. On top of the monster's unique abilities, fire element attacks may also burn through your hero decks, depleting them faster. On the flip side, there's talk about fire gear being able to discard cards from the top of your hero deck to boost damage and abilities. Coral and water enemies will dabble in regeneration and limit the number of cards that you can play in a turn, whilst coral gear will involve healing effects and putting cards from your hero discard pile back into your deck, lengthening the amount of time before a reshuffle occurs. With this in mind, it appears that the game is still evolving to some degree, dialing up complexity and consistency across the board, which proves promising for folks who wanted a bit more mechanical meat on the game's bones. Now, it's time to ask. Has the game proven itself promising enough for a late back from me? Wow, um, that's kind of a big question. For starters, I'll mention a bit about how different I felt this battle was compared to the Varaxxon fight. One of my primary concerns during the Kickstarter was whether or not the spread of monsters would offer truly unique battle experiences. I only have two examples to measure from here, but at least in regards to these two, I do agree that this battle experience was different enough to be considered sufficiently unique from the Fiery Fiend. Whether that will extend to the entire roster of monsters or not, I couldn't say. The terrain did a respectable job of offering more options and considerations in this fight, especially the rocks. Rocks have a tendency to be rather bland in other board games, so it was refreshing to see multiple paths of utility for them here. Do I discard this rock to cancel this behavior card's damage? Or do I save it for one of the cards that grants us an opening on the monster? Or do I perhaps save it for phase 3 to negate the bonkers attrition damage? I was certainly impressed by this. Now that I'm more familiar with the monster deck, I can envision future battles where I make more optimal use of those rocks by triggering the right behavior cards when I'm in rocky sectors. Now rocks are awesome, but the plateau is in a league of its own. I'd have to play the scenario a few more times to decide whether I just got really lucky with the plateau attrition checks, or if the plateau is simply a little too good in the hands of a fully armed hero force for this monster. 
It came in handy multiple times, and I think it was clever of the developers to remove the protection it offered during Phase 3 by converting it into two more rocks. As for the sand... I don't like sand. It's coarse, and rough, and irritating, and it gets everywhere. I thought the sand would be a bigger pain than it was, but it seemed that both characters generally had enough stamina to move through it when they needed to, likely as a result of the increased hand sizes afforded by the reef-bound armor. Broadening out from the terrain talk, I think the boss battle experience itself felt sufficiently different as well. As you may recall from the previous episode, once you completed the tail objective on the dragon, it didn't really matter too much where you attacked the dragon from. In the Toramat battle, your ability to exploit the monster's weakness depended on your ability to get the stony bony boy to bash a rock at the wrong time, which takes more potential planning and comes across as more engaging to me by comparison. We didn't get a chance to resolve those added special behavior cards in the battle today, but I looked through them after the battle and saw that we would have been greatly rewarded for triggering those cards when we had a rock nearby, so it looks like our gut guess was vindicated. Additionally, I liked the fact that the objective card wasn't entirely good for us this time, as it helped the monster build up rage tokens which would eventually lead to area of effect damage if the monster survived too long. The new gear abilities as well did a great job of broadening the options and considerations available to the heroes, sometimes even affording me new pursuits that weren't possible without them. During the dragon fight, unless you used assists, generally what you had in your hand by the start of your turn dictated the full potential of your turn. So, it was a nice surprise in this fight when Darion's start of turn recycle effect gave him a neat new card a little early, recontextualizing my potential plan with him for that turn. I also enjoyed parrying a blow or two for the monster with Darion's buckler, as a happy surprise which rewarded deck awareness. Mira's ability to put a discarded card on top of the deck when she takes damage seems like a great ability, though having it as a mandatory response made it seem a little less great in our playthrough today. I also don't think I'd have pursued Mira's new mastery condition without the extra card she got each turn from her reefbound armor, though the boss was dead before we really met the condition. It turns out, if she had gone into her mastery mode, she would have had yet another plus one hand size bonus and would get all the cards she put under the mastery card back in hand, which sounds insane. I'm certainly interested to see what other kinds of abilities and effects we'll see on other gear cards and mastery cards in the future. Perhaps we'll even see an item or potion that lets you peek at the attrition deck, or shuffle certain discarded attrition cards back into the attrition deck or something, I don't know. With this in mind, let's look at the original set of critiques that I referenced in episode 1, and see how they stack up with a few hours of play under our belts. Granted, it's possible that I've come to different personal conclusions than you about these issues, and the weight that they bear when evaluating the value proposition of the product, but I can only speak for myself. If you agree, or if you disagree, I'd certainly be interested to hear your thoughts below. Firstly, did the rotary boss feel ground-locked and immobile to me? Honestly, since I'm so spoiled by dungeon crawlers and boss battlers with combat boards, I did still notice the lack of spatial movement. But there's a surprising caveat to that answer. To my surprise, my time with the game recontextualized that aesthetic concern in my mind rather quickly. Sure, the dragon doesn't take flight and swoop about the board, but I grew unbothered by it much more quickly than I thought I would. I found that I would become so engaged with the core gameplay and optimization puzzle that I generally forgot about the less mobile representation of combat playing out via the components in front of me. When thinking about why, I eventually realized that if the game were purely card-based, I wouldn't be particularly bothered by the absence of defined movement from the boss or the heroes. In some fashion, I recognized that I had simply developed subconscious expectations from seeing other board and mini-driven combat games which biased me into thinking, well, the way you make these types of games is to have maps with square and hex spaces and movement all about them. Mind you, if a new Kickstarter came out that combined the onboard action of a traditional boss battler with Primal's card play, I would likely prefer it to Primal. But the theoretical concept of a Kickstarter like that shouldn't diminish the gameplay quality of what Primal is now. So, to wrap it up, yes, the bosses in the demo still appear like they're glued to a rotating platform but I easily lost sight of that when the card play got going. That said, while I like the visual appearance of the miniatures, I still think I'd personally have preferred a cheaper standee version, or a version with only the hero minis. 
To me, the experience still doesn't do enough with the boss minis to even the scales between their value to me and the cost that they added to the game's final price tag. To be charitable though, I played with the digital PNG standees here in the demo, so it's possible I'd feel differently about them if I had tactile experience with the physical minis and could appreciate the scale that they communicated. Next up, do I feel confident that the four space board design structure will allow for unique mechanical diversity between each boss and stage? I suppose it's difficult to make a final call on that one since I've only seen the two here. But both battles I played did feel distinct enough to have been considered separate experiences in my mind. I still worry that there's only so much you can do with the four quadrants as they are, but so long as the boss mechanics are varied and interesting enough to keep the puzzle satisfying, that worry may continue to soften. Unique boss terrain interactions, like those found in the Toramod encounter, will definitely help keep things fresh even with reused terrain assets. So, in review, I'm at least more confident that there's more design space for the game than I originally expected, which leans in the game's favor. Regarding the game's similarities to Marvel Champions, I can report that I've been sufficiently satisfied by my primal playthroughs to conclude that both games offer unique enough experiences to be different in my mind. There are some games that are so similar to one another that they essentially clump together in my brain, like Pandemic and its different offshoots but I don't personally feel that way about Primal and Marvel Champions. I think the board play is primarily what helps set it apart, especially the terrain interactions, and the battle mechanics make me think in a uniquely different way than Marvel Champions does. I will say, however, that I vastly prefer the variety of unique card arts in Marvel Champions compared to Primal's one-per-color card art in the hero decks. I hope Primal ends up with additional art for the hero cards, at least for a visual learner like me, card arts complement card functions in my brain to the point where I could usually tell you what a card in Sentinels the Multiverse does just by looking at the card art alone. Lastly, it's time for my largest personal drawback, the price. When you consider that the game's base box set is equivalent in price to the likes of something like Aeon Trespass Odyssey, I can't help but wonder about the game's value compared to other products of a similar price. Senko Kushin 5 Sacrifices is coming up, and it aims to offer a full KDM-style package of board-based combat, beautiful boss minis, and unique combat mechanics. So how will this game stack up compared to the asking price for that one? Townsfolk Tussle's expansions are coming up before the end of the year as well. If only Primal was made cheaper via a standee pledge option. I think my personal mental calculus would definitely be easier with that consideration. Primal has a lot going for it even more than I initially realized, but the board game price tag on what still largely appears to be a card game is a sizable millstone around the neck of Primal's value proposition. So, with all that firmly in mind... I don't need it. I don't need it. I definitely don't need it. I certainly don't. But... Okay, need is a strong word, but come on, did any of you really think I was going to pass on this one? Looks like the boss battler moniker maintains its unchallenged grip on my wallet once again. This game is a primal example of how digital demos can work wonders for a game's perspective pitch. Sometimes, at least for me, playing a game for myself offers a new perspective that can flip my first impression of a game on its head. I remember thinking that Wingspan sounded like a dreadfully boring game but I actually ended up really enjoying it when I played it for myself. The same thing happened with cartographers as well. I guess I notice and or appreciate the design nuances in a game better when I play it myself than I do when watching playthrough videos. This simpleton skull is a bit thick sometimes, so perhaps it takes more effort for the magic of a game to really sink in for me than it does for others. And that was certainly the case here. Primal thoroughly impressed me, and it fell right in with the likes of the other card-based combat games that I adore. I really like the reaction system driving the boss's behavior, which gives you enough information to eventually learn what the boss is planning, but not necessarily ensuring you can avoid or negate its tactics every time. I think the 10-round timer and limited healing both help keep the battle moving along, preventing your characters from treading water too long if they want to maximize their chances at taking down the monster. I'll have to dig into the details of all the expansions to determine which ones I really want, but the expansion that adds the two new heroes seems like a good first choice. Any expansion recommendations you'd like to share? Happy to hear your suggestions in the comments below. 
As far as the price is concerned, well, it still seems a bit steeper than I'd like. I'm sure I could recoup some of the cost by selling the boss minis online if I wanted to. Thank y'all so much for watching. Now that I've got my boss battling boots back on, I think it's about time we head back to the Scalding Shoreline to battle some aquatic nightmares. Until then, happy gaming, everyone.